you're about to find out that the format of this video is not something that I'm totally comfortable with yet and something that I'm not totally figured out, but it's something that I have been talking about pursuing for a long time. It's something, it's a, it's a type of video that I'm very interested in doing more of. In this video, I had a chance to sit down with Trevor Bauer, who just recently got traded to the Cincinnati Reds from the Cleveland Indians and is going to be a starting pitcher for them. And he has a background in FPV. He flies FPV drones, but he's also this, you know, he's a, a incredibly talented uh, MLB baseball pitcher. And I wanted to take a take time to sit down with him and think through different aspects of mental performance that could carry over from baseball into drone racing. Because drone racing is such a new sport and something that we haven't had a lot of time to play with and figure out and develop philosophies around, I want to start diving into what it looks like to practice and develop and perform mental performance within this industry. And so having chances to reach out into other industries and other sports and, and high performing athletes or business people or whatever and take their ideas and their knowledge and their understanding of what it means to be a top mentally performing individual and bring that over to the world of drone racing. So this is kind of my first stab at it. I think it's a fairly safe stab because we have a really, really natural connection. So I hope that you guys are interested in this. Definitely leave comments and tell me more about whether or not you want to see more or less of this um, and, and give me any feedback you have on what you would want to see out of stuff like this in the future. So thanks very much for listening to my little rant and now enjoy the whole video. So, I, I'm not really sure of like what the format of this is supposed to look like, so we're kind of just winging it uh, as it would be. Um, so, I'm Paul Nurkula, Nurk FPV, and with me today is uh, our special guest, Trevor Bauer, uh, starting pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, FPV enthusiast, um, has made some infamy for himself, but uh, welcome <laughs> to, the, to the show today. Uh, Starting off hot. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think the place that I always want to start when I meet and am getting to meet someone or getting to know someone in uh, FPV and is, you know, like, how did you get started? You know, it's I, it, I, I feel like it's a very similar for a lot of us. So I'm actually really curious to hear from you if it's mine is likely extremely different. Um, I watched I'm a huge Star Wars fan yeah. and or chase scenes. I saw a video of people flying drones in Ergony, France through a forest in a race course. I was like, that is super sick, and i got to learn how to do that. That was in 2014, I think. And uh, at that time, there was no, there's no like, consistent documentation on how to build or fly drones. So it was like stuff that you're gathering on receivers from 2004 and these motors that you got, but there's no documentation any like any more recent than 2008. And there wasn't like kits that you could buy and you can go down to the store and get like a little toy drone or anything. So I decided to build my own um, and just try to piece it together. Uh, I didn't really want to buy a carbon fiber frame for some reason. I wanted to learn like <laughs> how to build my own and just I was like, oh, I'll just go get down and like get some wood or something, make a frame. Yeah. I was an engineering major in college, so I was like super excited about this whole endeavor. And uh, so I put together a wooden frame from Home Depot. I had my flight board mounted on there and learned how to wire it and took like probably a month and a half to figure out how to get it all together. And then uh, got the motors to spin and it was like 11 o'clock at night in Texas. My backyard is very small. And uh, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go and hover it. So I went out there, oh boy. set it on my table, stood inside because <laughs> I didn't know. I was like looking through my window because I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, probably the most caution I've ever exercised in 
my drone workings. Uh, but I turned the motors on, hovered it, or tried to hover it. Nothing happened. It's like, what the hell? Maybe I need more throttle. Maybe it's a lot heavier than I thought. <laughs> Bumped it up. Got all the way to like 80% throttle, and it wasn't getting off the table. Oh, boy. And I was like, that's, I don't know what's going on. So I killed it. Took like four days doing research, trying to figure out like the motor spin, like I, the props are the right side, like it should work. Figured out then that I had the props on reversed, so oh, I was pushing, just pushing down into the yeah, table, pushing into the table. <laughs> so then I was like, oh, I finally figured it out. I feel like such an idiot. I'm gonna go hover it again. I figured it out at night. Switched the props around, put it on the table. Like I got this. Like blipped it a little bit, and I could see it kind of like starting to lift off. I was like, all right, I'm yeah. just gonna hover it a little bit. As soon as it got off the ground, it shot up in the air, <laughs> flipped over, and like smashed into my rocks. And I was, so then with I, wooden arms. With wooden arms, like completely shattered and broken. Oh. I was like, what the hell happened? I was like, so at this point, I was so ready to just scrap the entire idea of flying. Yeah. And uh, what kept you going? Came to find out that it was my like mix and my radio was on helicopter uh. instead of airplane. And so it had this like custom mix and mo whatever. But there's no documentation on it. No, so of course not. How am I supposed not. to know, you know? But uh, then I hovered it. I finally figured it out like a week later, hovered it. And then after it hovered, I was hooked. Yeah. Like, now I got to learn how to fly. Of course, I wanted to go straight into the goggles and learn how to fly like line of sight. Yeah. So I took off the first time. I was like, oh, this is awesome. Just like flying around. Had no idea how to land. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, keep getting higher and higher and I'm like, uh, I don't have any landmark uh, and I don't know what to do, how to bring it down. So it was a, it was a rough first year and a half. Yeah. Um, broke it all the time. Like ripped wires, had to get new electronics, all had to ship in from overseas. There's no domestic suppliers. Took a month to get it. Yeah. Like very frustrating. But then, uh, then the blackout frame came out and I decided to get that because it was supposed to be more durable. It supposed out to it be. Was. Oh, that's good. Okay. More durable than wood. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did you then, like did you like stain your arms and stuff like make it look like no, real pretty? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I just function over. Yeah, yeah, look, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I got the blackout frame and built it with uh, nylon standoffs that it came with. Okay. And yeah. then every time I crashed, the top plate would rip off yeah. and the wires would get Ugh. yanked. Pulled into the motors and chopped up. It was just bad. Electronics would be ruined, like batteries would be cut and yeah. all that stuff. But eventually you started making your own frames again. Yeah. Um, so I went blackout, then I ordered, I can't even remember what I ordered. Oh, alien frames were next. Okay. And then as I was flying the alien, I was like, oh, I like certain parts about this, but I want to do it differently. Do it your own way. Yeah. And so this time I actually did it correctly. <laughs> I got a CAD program and okay. uh, I use Onshape. It's like a cloud-based okay. CAD program. And, and you got a, you have a carbon, like a CNC at home? Nope. 3D? So I send, oh, okay. I send that off. Uh, okay. The CNC stuff I send off to get cut okay. and sent back to me, but I do have a 3D printer. Yep. So I designed the frame and all the different parts on, on the CAD uh, software, send the carbon out, 3D print the um, TPU stuff, yeah. order all of the motors and everything like that, assemble it, find out that I absolutely hate it, go back. Like if I was smart, I would just assemble it with like a 3D printed yeah. hard plastic first, no. but I'm not smart. No. So just order the carbon. <laughs> I'm like, this is going to work. I know it. Go out and fly it like three times. I'm like, oh man, there's nowhere to mount the antenna. And yeah. The battery just flew off and got chopped, and then an arm broke, yep. and I barely even crashed. So back to the drawing board. So I'm probably on revision, like, <laughs> shoot, probably my eighth or ninth oh, revision wow. of the frame that I'm working with. But you still definitely prefer your own design over anything else, even if it has some shortcomings sometimes, because. Yeah, I think it just, like, I probably I could probably fly something else mm -hmm. and enjoy flying it as much, possibly even more. Yep. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that design frames that that's their entire job and they yeah. go through a bunch of testing and they're yeah. great frames, you know. But something about the process of like just knowing that it's mine and that I went through the whole process. Like, yeah. That's how my mind works. And yeah. 
I kind of get to connect back to my engineering roots and go through that process. I was going to say, so you have an undergrad as a mechanical engineer. Do you think that designing your own frames and building quads and stuff like kind of scratches the itch that you would have had for, yeah. you know, mechanical design and yeah. all that? Definitely. Um, do you get super analytical with it? Like, oh, this is that <laughs> stress fracture point. Like, and you know, how do I overcome this in CAD? And like, yeah. or, or is it just kind of like, eh, it's not quite right. Let's just try something else. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty analytical for me. Like, yeah. I measure it down to the gram. Nice. Estimate it in CAD. Yep. Then compare how accurate it is once I get it fully built out. And it's like, okay, well, I was using steel standoffs. Shave off 20 grams. Yeah. It should give me a little bit better performance. Yeah. But this is like, so I go through that whole process. Um, I like, like the, the conundrum I'm in right now is I like having my battery internally mounted. Yep. Because then it doesn't fly off, it doesn't get chopped up. Yep. Like your quad stays on. If you crash, you can find it. I've lost drones all over the world where the battery <laughs> falls off and I just have no idea where it went. Oh, out, so I can't find you can't, it. the beeper's not coming on anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The whole deal. So, um, I like having the battery internally mounted, and that gives me the ability to keep the center of mass very close yep. to the center of the frame, which yep. is great, until you crash and you have a lever arm of now six or seven inches of this massive center of mass and then snaps a bunch of arms. Uh, so I, interesting. I, no matter how I try to organize the stress points, <clears throat> or how thick, or how wide I mean I make yeah. the arms, yeah. like they snap yep. really easily. So I've been trying to find higher grade carbon fiber because I feel like the carbon fiber that I was using wasn't high enough grade, but I don't know like where to find it. Yeah. But uh, considering going to like six inch, or uh, sorry, six millimeter thick arms. But that increases the weight. Increases the weight. And then, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. But I've been busy launching a couple different companies the past year. So I haven't, I put my design stuff on hold and just been flying the, the rig that I have, and I ordered five frames in, so I have plenty of arms. Yeah. When I snap them, I just yeah, yeah. take the five minutes and replace it, and I'm yeah. annoyed, and then go fly again. I noticed with yours, it was really easy to just take off a couple uh, nylock nuts and put a new one on. Yep. Um, we should probably actually just pull it in here and talk about it for a little bit at some point. But yeah. um, uh, so, so you just mentioned that you're super busy. You're starting a couple companies. You have a career as an MLB pitcher. You know, that's a lot to to happen at one point. Um, do you, do you find that FPV is kind of an escape from that? Like it's an opportunity to just clear your mind and go fly. Like what is what is it like? What does it mean to you to fly? What does it feel like to fly? Yeah. Um, so I guess to start it off, my brain is very analytical, and I needed something creative to get outside of that. Yeah. Um, so I got into FPV and the like expression of flying is that yeah. and then you take the video and you can create something with that and that led me down the line of I want to get better at video editing yeah and then I wanted to get better at like production of a video so it wasn't just a flying yeah. thing it was like there's some b-roll on it and then I was like well I need to get a camera for that yeah higher quality I want to be able to color grade yeah and I was like, well, I want to get a picture, or a camera that can take high quality pictures. So when I travel, I can have pictures of that and yep. decorate my walls with it. So I got a camera. And then like that led me down uh, the path that like in the off season when I was training at Driveline, which is the facility I train at in Washington. Okay. I would talk to the guys who run the video uh, department, the I, whatever, video department at the company. Yeah. Um, and so then that's really how I bonded with my best friend, Taiki. And then Taiki and I started a media company together. Mm -hmm. um, Called? Momentum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess I should be better at plugging it. <laughs> but yeah, we started uh, Momentum. Yeah. And so now that, like, it's kind of an intertwining of all the different things I enjoy. Yeah. It, my escape turned into a passion, turned into a job. Yeah. <laughs> and so, well, so do you still find that it's relaxing? Or yeah. do you kind of sometimes, yeah. like, I got to get the shot? Yeah. No, I... I I've, tr I've tried very hard not to sell anything that I make in FPV okay. or anything like that because yeah. I want that to be a hobby. It's just you. Yeah. yeah. And then the production side of things, like, yeah, I want to get the shot. So we did a video where I got some shots of Progressive Field yeah. um, and the city and the skyline of Cleveland and stuff. So it was cool to see that then make the cut of yeah. one of our videos. Um, I'd love to do more. I'd, 
I want to build a rig that straps a DSLR to it so you can, I think the possibilities of getting like cinematic, like uh, enough cinematic style to it with yeah. enough like raw feel of the flying is yep. very intriguing. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully that makes it into some of our stuff this off season when I have more time to actually get out and, and do it. We're going over to Japan and China, so hopefully Ooh. we can get some shots over there that make some of the episodes. We're going to do a whole like off season show. Yeah. So just off camera, if you want me to connect you with anyone in China to fly, like I know a few people in many of the bigger cities yeah. that can take you to the right kind of spots to fly. Awesome. Some say that we can fly the Great Wall. <laughs> but I don't know. It's, I've seen it done. But yeah, I've, I've seen it done too. Yeah. Not sure who got who oh, yeah. got in trouble for that or not. Yeah. So you want to walk us through? Uh, I mean, so this is revision nine. Yeah. Um, what uh, what are you what are you battling with right now? What uh, what does, what's going to happen with revision ten? Um. Yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing is like the battery mounts inside like right in the frame here. Yep. And so the lever arms, like I was saying, if, I, like if I'm flying and I hit something and I crash like this, there's a, a large lever just, arm. So <laughs> yeah, it's just, it snaps right here, yep. like right across this stress point oh. in line with the carbon and right where they meet. So I've tried making some like extensions, but it mm -hmm. just moves this fracture point out yeah. and it snaps. So right. um, trying to figure out how to beef that up so that I don't break as many arms. I love the fact that the battery mounts inside. I love how it all goes together. Um, I'd like a more durable GoPro mount up front. I just have to design that on CAD. That was going to be a question. Um, so I noticed yesterday <laughs> you're literally like taping up a piece of uh, yeah. uh, Kleenex. Yeah. Uh, but you have 3D printing and the CAD mount. Why? What's yeah. what's stopping you from printing something out? To I've been so busy that okay. I like, <laughs> I destroyed it maybe two months ago. Okay. And I've been so busy with spring training yeah. and the company and like baseball and all these different things that I just haven't, I literally haven't had time to set up my 3D printer. And oh just man, print. that's so, crazy. Um, Good problems to have though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But now that I'm gonna be flying more, I got a bunch of my processes under underway and yeah. like automated in, in a way. So I'll have more time to actually fly. So that's one of the Good. things I wanna do is print it. Another thing is like this, while it's like, I really like how this is back here, like it's, I designed it to be flexible yep. so that when you hit something, it doesn't snap the antenna yep. or mm -hmm. bend it or whatever. But it's a little bit too flexible so that it gets chopped up in, Ooh, in yeah. the prop sometimes. Um, so getting that hammered out. Uh, I've also, the sec I just built one a day or two ago uh, before we went out and flew. Yeah. And I want to test, oh, I guess that's one thing I haven't, like I fly it upside down. Yep. Um, the reason for that is I wanted to get clear I want to get the arms clear of the thrust from the props mm -hmm. and the turbulence to try to limit some jello. Yep. Um, I know I don't get quite as much thrust because the arm gives turbulent air to the props, yep. but I feel like the trade-off to get smoother footage yeah. is there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's why I mounted it upside down. And then the orange things here, um, the holes in the arms where the motors mount are actually cut they're M3 screws, so three millimeters uh, wide, yeah. and they're cut five millimeters wide. The holes are five millimeters wide. Okay, yeah. So the orange things actually pop down, so the screws are completely insulated from, so there's two sides oh. of it with that. So these are four millimeter, five millimeter arms. Okay. The extensions on the, so it's a flat piece, this orange piece, and then and the, the extension is like tubes two and a half. Yeah. So they just go together, so then the screw fits in the middle. Is there one on the other side too? Yep. So both sides. So, so the, the motors are completely soft mounted. So if the motor shorts, it's gonna, it's not gonna be touching the carbon to be able to send electric. Uh, yeah. And it's fully soft mounted. And it's fully soft mounted. So. Did you I, notice a big uh, bump in uh, the smoothness of the footage after that? Uh, I did, but I also at the same time like changed to the to a new flight controller, okay. updated software. Um, I started on the Helio Spring when yep. Butterfly oh, yeah. first came out. And so it was like the first one that had two onboard processors uh, uh, yeah, that's filtering right. and the whole deal. Yeah. So I wasn't sure exactly what um, helped, but the footage did come out. Hey, as long as it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. Engineering number 101. <laughs> I do think that the, like, you can actually move the motors around a little bit like, yep. because of the soft mounting. Yep. So I think I probably get a little bit of 
performance lag from okay. that. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out, because I have the GoPro a lot of times mounted on top, so the center of gravity without the GoPro is perfect because the yeah. battery carries it, yeah. but the, it gets a little bit off with the GoPro on it. And okay. so I feel like there's some times where I'm flying it where it's like a little bit, like I have to compensate a little bit for that yeah. and can't quite tune it out. Yeah. Um, Do you want so to go anyway, through your uh, electronics stack right now real quick? Like uh, the motors? Shoot, I don't even know. So, yeah, oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> on the so spot. I fly, I fly 6S, so yep. I got some 1660s on here. Um, 2306 brother hobby, I think. Yep. Um, I forget what the, exactly what they're called, but they're pretty recognizable. They're rainbowy yeah, motors. Yeah. Um, Crossfire. Crossfire. Unify. Yep. Unify, TBS Triumph. Yep. What's your flight controller these days? We got the Helio Spring. Okay. And then I don't know, it's an all in one ESC, but I don't know what brand, what model it is. They all fly very similar. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So, yep, that's the setup. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about this guy? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I guess we'll cover the whole drone injury. <laughs> we don't have to uh, do that. <laughs> no, it's, it'll be fun. I, I think it'll be fun to hear your side for the drone industry as, as a whole, yeah. just because I feel like a lot of people do know about it, but, for, but from the baseball side, yeah. so maybe from the drone side. So it was actually revision three of this drone. Um, and originally I had the flight controller and everything was up front like it is here, but the battery mounted through the back, yep. and then I had 3D printed housing on the side where the um, like ESC and stuff like that would mount on the oh, side okay, of it, cool. with little uh, like a cover. So once I wired it, I would just flip the cover over and okay. zip tie it back here, okay. so it was covered from the props and everything. So all the cool. electronics were housed on the side, and the battery slipped in the back. So you must have been thrilled when four and one started, so that you're not like <laughs> zip tying yeah. covers. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I was. I had built a new one, and I went out and flew it that day. It was working great. And then halfway through my second flight, it just like tumbled out of the air. I didn't know which motor it was that failed or which ESC. Yeah. So naturally, I would like go home, take the props off, flick the motors on, and see which one wasn't working. Yeah. But when I would take the props off and flick the motors on, all of them would work. Oh, yeah. And so it's like, under load that. Yeah. yeah. I was like, what's going on here? So I put the props back on and um, set it over in the corner, backed up, and I was going to do it. But in order to do that, I got to plug it in. Yep. So I put the battery in and it mounted the battery plugged in just on top like this. But so it was originally right side up. Yeah. So I put the battery in like this and I was plugging the battery in like right here. And as soon as it touched, this motor spun up at full throttle for whatever reason. I don't know if the board shorted or yeah. what was going on, but my pink, it was, a, it was also a three and a half inch yep. version of it, like a really small one. So yep. the motors were a lot closer in. So when I was plugging it in, this blade cut me once, twice, three times before I could get my hand out of there. Yep. Went like this through the battery, apparently pretty hard because it like hit the wall like <laughs> 10 feet behind me. I looked down. Like it didn't really even hurt, but I yeah, looked yeah. down, I saw a flap of skin hanging open, I could see my bone, no blood yet, and I like watched as the blood slowly like started to bubble up. I was like, that's not good. So the first thing I thought of was I gotta tie it off. Couldn't find anything to tie it off with. <laughs> Found a hotel uh, towel, put pressure on it and wrapped it up. Then I was like, okay, I gotta get to the hospital because I'm gonna need stitches. This is two games, two days before the ALCS, like at three o'clock in the morning in my hotel room. On your pitching hand. On my pitching hand. So I'm holding it like this, like trying to dial the, like, <laughs> but I had set the phone on the ground because I was using the table. Because you need the space workspace. for your drone. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like laying on the ground, hold, like trying to dial the front <laughs> desk and like hold the phone. <laughs> and took a cab to the hospital, was there till like seven in the morning. They gave me 14 stitches, uh, texted my trainer and I was like, ah, this is probably not the text you want to be getting at 4.30 a.m., but uh, I sliced my pinky open. I'm in the hospital right now. I'm getting stitches. So I oh, made it back man. to the hotel at like 7.30 and hadn't slept, obviously. So I was supposed to be at the field at like 2 that day for workout. So I went to get some sleep. 7.30, fell asleep. 8.10 rolls around. I'm getting like bangs on the door. Like, 
wake up, I'm getting calls, I'm like completely like asleep. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. Exhausted. After a long night. And so I'm trying to like, why are people banging on my door? It must be room service or uh, the cleaning service or whatever. So I yeah. ignore it. Phone would ring. I'm like, why are they calling me? Ignore it. Finally, I got up. I'm like, what is the deal? I was so annoyed. I look out and the person standing there is like from the front desk. I'm like, this is odd. I'm like, hey, uh, Mike Segi is trying to get a hold of you. He needs you at the field as soon as possible. So I texted him. He's our traveling secretary. Yep. I texted him. I'm like, hey, I haven't got any sleep. I was planning on coming in at one. Is that okay? He goes, no, you need to get here as soon as possible. Oh, man. So they actually had to make roster decisions for the ALCS yeah. at, by 10 a.m. that day. Oh, man. So I got to the field at like 840, and they looked at it and like, are you going to be able to throw? And I was like, yeah, I'll be able to pitch. Yeah. I wasn't concerned about it. Yep. I was like, it's just going to be a pain thing. So yeah, just yeah. Stitch, once the stitches are in, just numb it or whatever, and right. it'll be fine. So they had me out there like five hours after it happened or whatever. Holy crap. Or six hours after it happened with fresh, st fresh stitches in my pinky, like playing catch in the hallway. Yeah. And like blood was like oozing through the stitches. Oh my gosh. And then they ended up making the decision to put me on the roster and push me back two days because okay. we had the off day and I pitched yep. the third game instead of the second. And uh, yeah, I did a bunch of treatment on it and the whole deal. And then went out and pitched and Pop some stitches. No, the stitches actually didn't even pop. They did say? Okay. Yeah, the stitches were fine. But when they did the stitches, they did individual ones. So it was like a stitch, 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 whatever. Uh, so there was open spaces yeah, between. Yeah, and okay. so it was oozing out between. Whereas, uh, but once they had put those stitches in at the hospital, like the skin was so like wet and yeah. like you couldn't change them until after that start. We waited like two days. The skin was like healed up enough. Yeah that they went and put in like a linked stitch. So okay. if one would bulge, it would tighten the rest of them. And so oh, it like held everything together yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot better. And then I was fine after that. But uh, cool. yeah, that's it from my end. Well, so, but what I'm hearing is you were being very responsible about <laughs> how you were managing it. And yeah. the next step, no matter what, was to test it with the props on because it's not working without the props. And, and shit happens and yeah. and and something went wrong but like yeah i get you know. i get crap all the time like oh take the props off next time i'm like i did yeah i did like, yeah no I <laughs> i'm not gonna I, explain it to everybody but right. i did i'm not that big of an idiot <laughs> i am an idiot but not that big of an idiot. <laughs> so but awesome. yeah that was uh that was the early version of of this guy so is that why uh you have red infused carbon fiber like <laughs> You're mixing, you literally put your blood into put your work. Blood in, yeah. I guess we could look at it that way. Um, I just, that's the color that, uh, Soar Aerospace is a company that sent me this. It's yeah. like Kevlar infused, yep. like colored carbon or whatever. And so they reached out um, and sent me this and they asked me what color I wanted. Nice. And they had red, so. Well, you should go green next time. Yeah, well, have, yeah. I think they have a bright, like green yellow like that, I'm pretty sure. So maybe, just you, saying. Can get, uh, maybe you can get some custom colors on yours. <laughs> Awesome. So I actually want to step back a little bit to a couple of things that you said, um, especially at the beginning you said that um, you have a very unique story in how you got started, which I agree, um, but it's actually funny how many like similarities I thought that there were to mine. Yeah, I'd uh, love to hear yours. Yeah, so I, so in Christmas of 2014, my in-laws bought me like a little cheap toy for Christmas and, and, and I broke it. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm an engineer. A software engineer, but yeah. it, I, I should I should have the appropriate Google foo to go <laughs> fix this. And so I, I went online. I'm like researching how to fix this drone. And, and like you're saying, there's you know there's not a lot of information, yeah. or and what information there is is also like sparsely placed that you don't know if you're looking at the right thing or the wrong thing. Do you remember what model it was? Hoopson uh, X10. Okay. Yeah, the little just like it's like 40 yep. bucks. You can pick it up at Walmart. Yep. And. Uh, so, but in the process of learning how to build drones and fix drones, I found that exact same video, the, the Juzz yep. French Forest video, yep. um, which I was just in France flying a couple of days ago, and I was like, this is it. This is where <laughs> we're at. Um, you flew the same spot? It wasn't the same spot, but it but felt yeah, like yeah, the same yeah, spot. Yeah, I was like, this is awesome. But uh, so, so when you said that, I was just like, yeah. Like, I remember seeing that video for the first time. I was sitting at, at work um, just at lunchtime or whatever, probably not at lunchtime. But <laughs> and I just I remember watching it and being like I have to do this. Yeah. Like it was not a choice. It was not an option. It was like I need to learn how to race drones. Yeah. And you know, and from that point off, you know, it was just I bought everything, learned how to build. My first was a um, 
ZMR250, so very similar to the Blackout. And, yeah. and, then, and then even even what you're saying is about the creative side is like, you, you know, I, I have never seen myself as a creative person. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in, in writing or uh, doing art or whatever. But when I kind of started getting into cameras and getting into filming with the quads and normal yeah. cameras and all that stuff, like it, it started to fill that itch for me. And I, and I felt honestly like healthier as a, as a human, right? Like mm -hmm. that now that I've taken the time to, to, to do something creatively, you, you were able to express ourselves in a way that yep. we hadn't thought of before. So I, I really appreciated you saying that is because yeah. I, felt, I felt very much the same way. It's interesting that you came to it from an engineering side and got into the video side yeah. and creative side. That's yeah. the exact same process that I followed. So, yeah. I, cause I, 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 I don't see myself as a creative person at all. Right. People are like, oh, you're so creative. I'm like, not really. Yeah. What do you mean? Like, well, you do video, you fly drones, you build, like you, um, I like do sketches and draw sometimes yeah. and whatever, but it's all like, I've, I've taught myself how to do all of that yeah. through like an engineering process. Yeah. Like, okay. This is my end result that yeah. I want, and I'm here. Here are the obstacles to getting <laughs> to the end result, and so I need to learn enough about this, enough about this, enough about this to get yeah. to my end result. There's like freedom in following the rules, yeah. essentially. Like yeah. you become, you you achieve the goal by, you know. We so you and I look at it as like painting by the numbers, yep. but everybody else sees the end result. Right. And and I think either way, creativity is is that end result, and how you get there is, yeah, either irrelevant or beautiful as part of the process right yeah. yeah to me like if i put together a video it's like okay mm. i'm gonna have this song mm. but i want the song to match the footage so yep. i'm gonna fly to that song yep and then i need to have enough b-roll to introduce this so yep. it's like i need to capture these shots get this but that the yeah, part of actually like flying going is, through a list is fun yeah. but there's like a formula it's like a b c d put it all together song yeah. boom production Absolutely. But other people are just like, oh, like let me grab this and let me grab this and they'll take this from <laughs> over here and they put it together and they're like, wow, that's sick, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You know? And that's, that's their process. Right. That's how that yeah, works. But exactly. for for you and me, it's like, how do we walk our way through this and make it make it be what we see as the end result? And that's, yeah, that's cool. What did you? So when you were a software engineer, what did you work on? Uh, so I worked for a digital marketing startup first of all, okay. um, and so I would basically make tools for. Um, like people that were doing in, like statistics analysis on marketing programs to help them learn how like to understand the data that they're working on um and then after that i was a cto for a like a crowdfunding startup interesting yeah have you ever looked at flight controller no logic and stuff it, it's i i've thought about it but i i'm i was a programmer because i was good at speaking programming yeah. and speaking to business people okay. and not because I was really good at programming. Gotcha. Um, so I have considered it, but then as soon as I remember that I'm really actually a pretty bad programmer, <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, I'm not. Nah, we're good. <laughs> I don't need to do that. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit. Well, and, that's, and that actually was part of what led into my going after FPV was that I, I realized at a certain point that like I'm never going to be the best programmer at something or even close to but maybe i have a shot at kind of pursuing drone racing and and you know and four years later world championship title and yeah you know so it's like it's you know on, in one way like i didn't like programming because of that but in another it kind of gave me the freedom and the realization to go after something else yeah makes sense all like a process stepping stones to like get to your ultimate destination yeah what, uh, when you first got into drones, obviously there's no, there's no industry. No. Right? It was just a bunch of like random dudes, nerds that yeah. enjoyed flying and were like the more, the most like industry like thing was like a Facebook group where yeah. you could find guys to collaborate <laughs> with, yeah. you know? Now it's this global industry. There's, it's booming. Yeah. There's so many different applications, maybe not for FPV, but just drone tech in general. Yeah. I don't think anyone really saw like the drone racing stuff becoming a large part of that industry, but it has. Yeah. Where do you see that? Like, what's the five-year and ten-year outlook on that? I was hoping to ask you that. Oh, okay. But well, well we can but, just talk. Well, yeah, about let's it. talk about it together. Because ultimately, I just want to. Like, I'm interested in. Like, you're heavily involved in this yeah. space, obviously. So, yeah. 
Like, I, I enjoy talking to people yeah. that understand where industries are going and mm -hmm. like, because like at the beginning you couldn't make money racing drones. It was like a Facebook yeah. group thing right. that you met oh, up yeah. in a park. Definitely and it was not. Like, yeah. Maybe there was a trophy <laughs> that was like a prop or something with a, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But now it's like you can actually, there's people that professionally race. Right. That, you know, that they make their living doing that, which is, I think is awesome. And, and the reason that I kind of wanted to approach you about that was because, you know, you're coming from a, I mean, because at the end of the day, like really, like sports is almost kind of an entertainment industry. Yeah, and it is. It, and it's also kind of, a, I don't know, the, the, when I look at baseball, there's this, there's legacy, there's history, there's, um, there's, there's reason for people to get invested. Yep. And when I look at drone racing, like we have some whiz bang, some cool stuff at the at the beginning, but it's not something that that hooks people long term, right? Like right. people that are fans of teams, like are are hooked and invested, and in, and they, you know, you become a diehard, or maybe not even a diehard, or right. you know, a right, fan right. of like your city, or or yeah. even if you move somewhere else, like you're still a fan of that place. Like, what do you think it would take for drone racing to develop? that kind of mentality or do they need to do they need to find something else to to develop that 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 entertainment value yeah i think i think you gotta look more at sports like golf okay ufc esports no yeah. stuff like that baseball baseball soccer football basketball like those are very much team sports local yep. you know there's different franchises in different cities like you said and the city surrounds um, their team and gets yeah. behind them. But golf, like, that doesn't really exist in golf. You, know, you have golfers from all over the world yeah. and fans are fans of specific players. Yeah. You're a Tiger Woods fan, you're a Rory McIlroy fan, yeah. you're a, you know, whatever the case is. And so, similar with um, esports, mm -hmm. you know, the, I guess you have like clans or groups of people yeah. that, you know, gaming groups, but. Um, Sorry, one second. <coughs> oh, still getting rid of stuff from the bando yesterday. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it just I, keeps tickling that me. me up too. <laughs> Sorry. So um, esports. Um, yeah, or like UFC because you have fighters. Like very few fans of UFC are fans of like a sp specific fight camp. There's fans yeah. of that fighter. Yep. And fighters come from Brazil and Russia and yeah. Australia and all over the place. You know. So I think that's more of the model of like you'll have dedicated Nurk fans or Gab fans yeah. or whatever the case is. Um, and so how do you connect that? How do you connect like you as a personality yeah. to fans? What's easily identifiable with you as a personality and like what's your sector? Because yeah. like drone pilots are going to share a certain amount of nerdiness. Just getting into the hobby, right? Which so, we fully admit. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a ton of other things that like, like you might come to it through software engineering, someone else might come to it through just a love of like, yeah. Star Wars that yeah. they saw this thing and they just had to get into it, yeah, or whatever. Absolutely. Like there's different personalities there. So blowing up the, like the personality and finding the universal themes that fans can identify with. Like, did this guy struggle as a kid and this was an escape? Like maybe I struggle as a person and like yeah. I can get behind that process. Yeah. Or like maybe this guy came from um, it, whatever, it was like bullied as a kid or yeah. maybe he came from a rich family yeah. but he's found his way in life. Like yeah. some of those universal personality storylines. Storyline, yeah. And building that around, in a natural way, around each of the characters, yeah. each of the pilots. I think is the best way to do it. It's something that baseball really struggles with. Yeah. And something that I'm trying to do with momentum yeah. is cr promote the individual and that personality yeah. and open that up to a larger group of people that can identify with that path. And um, you're doing that not just with yourself, but with all of the players that you're interviewing. You're trying to help bring a, right. a, a, face, a name to the face, to the story, yeah. and helping people kind of look at them and say oh i i can relate to that in this way yeah. and you know helping develop not just fans for yourself but fans of the sport and of individuals exactly. within it yeah like carlos carrasco came to the states from venezuela yeah. and was making like 80 dollars a week when he first got here yeah. and living in an apartment with seven other venezuelan guys a two-bedroom apartment 
and didn't know any of the language. And then oh, yeah. saved up for a month to buy a bike because they had to walk 25 minutes to the stadium every day because they yeah. didn't have a car. And so he bought, it, he bought this bike and uh, rode it to the stadium, rode it back, went to sleep, woke up in the morning and someone had stolen his bike and he never got another bike. And like, that's a story that if you don't know Carlos Carrasco and you don't talk to him like that, you just see him on the field and yeah. it's like, well, I like this guy as a pitcher or I don't. Yeah. Like, he plays for my team, so I yeah. like him. Or, like, he always beats my team, so I don't like him. And then, like, he's just a uniform and, yeah. you know. Yeah. But if you tell that story and a bunch of people hear that, like, man, like, I'm rooting for this guy. Like, he came from that and he made it all the way there. There's yeah. hope for me that I can come from, like, whatever situation yeah. I'm in and, like, get to where I want to go, you know. Absolutely. Um, and if, like, if Sean Maniah is a big gamer, and everyone just knows that he threw a no hitter in the big leagues. Like, there's a whole other sector of people that he can like appeal to. Yeah. If you get out the fact that he loves the game, and yeah. then it just is better for everybody. So. What's your storyline? <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> uh, so momentum actually did a, a documentary on it. Oh. Um, okay. Which is great. It's called Balance. Uh, I've done. Link in the description below. Yeah, there we go. I forgot <laughs> we're on YouTube right now, so we can link the description. Um, but uh, I've done, I, I've been all baseball yeah. all the time for my entire life. Yeah. Like starting in freshman year of high school when I stopped playing soccer. Yep. And I had a physics class that I just fell in love with Newtonian physics and wanted to learn how to apply that to baseball to make myself better. Newtonian physics, so that's where momentum comes from. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, like, s from that time, ninth grade on, it's been all, like, my mind has just been consumed with, like, how do I maximize each of these processes? Yeah. What am I deficient in? Build a process, <laughs> test it, retest, boost that up, find the next lowest hanging fruit, boost that up, and just try to, like, get to the highest level I can. So, like, just with your quad, just with your... Yeah. Uh, career yeah um, so everywhere it, else in life I assume too yes <laughs> it drives me nuts yeah because I I'll do it and I expect like if you write a certain line of code a certain way it does a certain thing yes it's predictable yes if it does not do that thing there's something wrong you find it you debug it you fix it and it does that thing yeah in baseball you write you work on certain things you do them yep. it doesn't work you fix them and it should work and it doesn't and then you fix them again and it should work and it doesn't and because it's not a defined like there's no definite outcome it's all there's you know it's for humans not robots yeah. so it get it got extremely frustrating for me I'm like i like i'm doing all the right <laughs> things it should lead to this and it's not and yeah. it just like drove me insane and so that's where like the reason i got into drones aside from the video is to help distract myself from baseball. So it was like, I, I finally found something that I really enjoy, that I'm really interested in, and I need to make sure I do this enough yep. that my mind doesn't just run on baseball. Yeah, yeah. And then that turned into video, and then once I started like traveling and getting away from it, where I wasn't just sitting in my room at night, yeah. like thinking about this while I was building a drone, yep. that's how it got me like to separate from baseball and <laughs> be able to evaluate things with like a clearer, mindset and so it made me happier i felt more yeah. fulfilled and then that made me better at baseball because i wasn't miserable every time i was at the field thinking about like why am i not as good as i should be like all the numbers hmm. say i should be this and i'm not why so that's kind of my story so you're like, kind of like accepting that you're not always going to meet the expectations you set for yourself but being a professional is about working your way there yep so the process and balancing out life, just like having enough different things that you're interested in yeah. that one doesn't consume you yeah. and drag you down. Yeah. Whether And so for a lot of people that might be work, like if they're working all the time, they yeah. don't have any hobbies, like yeah. that. Or if they only have hobbies. It's the only. Know, it's like you have to have a good array of things that you do to, so be, to feel fulfilled. Let me try to say it back to you. Is like So what you're saying is that the when the only measure of personal success is defined by work, which is all, which becomes all-encompassing, 
any misstep at work essentially brings you down as a person. It's a great way of saying it. And so if you're not finding a way to prove to yourself that you're an all right guy, yep. <laughs> you're gonna yeah. you're gonna go down a rabbit trail that you don't want to. No doubt. Yeah. That's hmm. a perfect way of saying it. Awesome. Um, because yeah, my personality like used to be tied heavily to baseball. Yeah. I would suck at the field and I would go home and I wouldn't want to see anybody. Yeah. And I would just be alone because I felt shitty about myself. Yeah. And now it's like I suck at the field, I go home, I give myself 12 hours to feel shitty. Yeah. And then the next day it's like, all right, like right, I'm gonna go hang out with this person yeah. or I'm gonna do this thing and like I'm excited about this. Yeah. Like I feel more alive. And that's, I mean, that's healthy no matter what aspect of life you're uh, applying it to. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Cool. Uh, the last place that I definitely wanted to go, and this is almost more for me than for that, but um, is to talk about mental strength. Yep. And so with, uh, the, I, I really, really like precision sports. Yep. So sports that aren't necessarily just about like, you know, well, I, I'd say, anyway, shooting or archery or, um, I, you consider bowling, for example, like a precision yeah. sport. It's about that repeatability, that yep. that ability to, to to let to get out of your own way and let your body take over. Yep. I'm guessing that pitching is very much in the same vein. It's it's yeah. it's how do I get out of my own way and let myself just throw the best that I know I'm capable of. Yep. I would say that drone like or racing in general, drone racing included, is a mental sport yeah. it's a precision sport and and so everyone as, knows the lines you can identify the right lines exactly like how often can you execute it yeah and, and so 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 for me as somebody that's only been a professional athlete for you know a year or two athlete whatever yeah. um is I, i'm curious to hear about your mental strategy and 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 what you do as as a as a long-term professional high performance athlete to make sure that your mental game is strong and what about it so i spent oh man i started training at a facility in texas when i was 14 years old and part of that was like looking back on it like probably the probably the most defining thing for my time at that facility was the morning mental work that we did mm. and it'd be like 15 minutes in the morning of some story or some quote or some just some little lesson about like how like uh, I don't know exactly how to explain it but like yeah. one of them would be like Michael Jordan didn't make his varsity basketball team and like he felt like a failure how did you overcome it or yeah. like you know Apple started in someone's garage and then grew to be this but it was almost bankrupt multiple times along the yep. way or whatever the whatever the case is like this Russian gymnast is still in the Olympics at 40 years old when you know all gymnasts are considered peaked at 15 or yeah. whatever so like just stories like this and then there would be some sort of like mental lesson to go with it like about perseverance or about like just being yeah dedicated to one thing or ha like whatever and so from the time I was 14 till the time I was 22, maybe 23, like, so for eight to 10 years of my life, like yeah. that was a huge part of my daily routine. Yeah. And I think the more you hear about how other people have struggled and still made it, yeah. the easier it becomes for you to struggle yep. because you still have hope of making it. Yep. The more you hear about how other people prepare and what gets them locked in, the yep. easier it becomes for you to get yourself locked in. Yeah. And it got to a point where like, I was doing so much mental stuff that like, I, had, like, I had booklets that I would look at before a start of like numbers yeah. and like just a grid of 100 numbers and how I would time myself, like how quickly I could check off like in order, like put a mark through all the numbers just to like how, how much can I stay locked in? Yeah. And does my mind wander or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, word puzzles, like just all sorts of different stuff like this. And I finally got to a point where like, I realized I was going too far with it and I had gotten a lot of the benefits that I was gonna get out of it. Okay. And so I kind of, I simplified things at the end of it. And now a lot of it's automated where I, 
it's just part of me to, all right, I suck today, great, I accept it, and this is why I sucked, work on it, and go again. Yep. And I don't have to think about it or like try to find motivation to do that because I've spent so long doing it, it's internalized. Yeah. When you look at performance mindset, because I do, I do a lot of studying on how to maximize my physical work. Yeah. It's like with racing, like if you buy a thousand batteries, you can sit and race the same course a thousand times, and you're not gonna like physically, you're not gonna be in danger of being hurt or whatever. You yeah. can't go throw a thousand pitches right. every single day yeah, yeah, yeah. or lift super heavy every single day. Right. Like mentally I would do that. Yeah. Except I have physical constraints obviously. Yes. So how do I take let's say I can make a hundred throws a day, how do yeah. I maximize those hundred throws? So I've done a lot of research on like performance mindset. Okay. How do you activate the brain in a way that you're getting the most out of each rep? Yeah. And when you look at like performance like when you want to perform in a high leverage situation, it ha there's, it has to be subconscious in yeah. a way. It has to be, your skill set has to be automated. Like two types of focus: there's internal and external focus, and then there's a narrow focus yeah. and broad. Yeah. Uh, and so, performance when you're like in the zone would be a narrow external focus. Yeah. I want to throw this ball 100 miles an hour to that specific spot. Yeah. I want to fly this drone through this on this line. Like, yeah. The worst thing you can be for performance is internal and broad. Okay. Or no, I'm sorry, internal and narrow. Like, yeah, yeah. I want to feel this exact movement with my thumb on the yeah, stick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and then it's just, you have no chance. When I was trying to change my delivery in 2013, I was thinking very internal and very narrowly internal. Yeah. And so I actually had to train myself how not to think like that. Yeah. So I developed a process to do that. I would throw without the lights on so there's no feedback of where the ball went. Just a laser dot that I was trying to hit. Okay. So I couldn't evaluate if my mechanics were good or not based on where the ball went. It yeah. was like I had to do the process of yeah, yeah. whatever. So that's all a very long-winded way of saying that like there's ways to train mental acuity yeah. and you just have to figure out the same, for me it's the same type of engineering process. What am I trying to get to? Mm -hmm. A higher level of consistency? Am I trying to maximize my reps? Am I trying to, what, what am I trying to do? And then let's figure out what, are, what do I struggle with right yeah. now? Like, do I space out in the middle of a race? Or do I, like, if I lose the first race, do I feel pressure on, like, having to win the next one? And, like, yeah. let me put myself in positions in practice that are more difficult than that, more stressful than that, yeah. to automate those reactions so that when I get to race day it's or pitch day or whatever it's yeah. automated do uh, for skill acquisition a lot of times it's best to not just train the exact same rep over and over and over it's to train differently yeah and so you train in the adaptation almost so yeah like, yeah if I like I only fly this drum I've only flown this for the last year so I've only flown the same rates same um, same kids, same weight distribution, yeah. and everything. Yep. But then when I go to fly a racer three and it's different, like I really struggled to yeah. fly that yeah. until I put my rates on it. But like if I want to be a super precise pilot, I probably should fly my rates, someone else's rates, different weights, different distributions, different camera tilts. And so when I pick up a new machine, I've already trained in a large set of inputs yeah, that yeah. satisfy that equation. Right. So that's now how I look at it. just about justifying the differences then at that point, the, yeah. small, the, the smaller differences. Right. Uh, and so that's how I look at like pitching. Like I want to learn how to throw a curveball to a spot, but I don't need to throw a thousand curveballs in a row. I should throw a curveball yep. and then throw a different size ball and try to you know throw it the same way. Yep. But then I need to throw on a different slope. And so every rep that I do is slightly different. Yeah. And so it builds in that adaptation. Yeah. So for that's like my skill acquisition and my automating like mental response processes. Do you, do you still experience like fear or nerves when you're on the mound? Or is it all, are you able to just kind of just totally lock out and just? So <coughs> there are times that like leading up to a game, I'll be like extra excited. Yeah. 
or and I guess maybe that's a little bit of nerves. You know, I yeah. don't know exactly how, sure. what my response to like nervousness is. Yeah, I've yeah. never really sensed that I was nervous. Okay. But I definitely sense different physiological responses yeah. to certain games. Yeah. Sometimes I go to the field and I'm just like very relaxed and like I need to find a way to get up. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I go to the field and I just like don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just like locked in from the second I wake up. Yeah. I'm like, okay, how do I, like, is that good? Do I want to be locked in all day? Like, does it take a toll on me? Yeah. Whatever. So like, but I notice these things. Generally though, once I start my actual warm up routine, because of the consistency of that routine, yeah. it all kind of goes away. Okay. And I think that that's, that's been super important to me. I know that an hour and a half before I start, I'm going to sit in the hot tub for five to seven minutes. I'm going to go put on my brain shocking device and get dressed in my uniform. Yeah. I'm going to go in the training room, I'm going to roll out on a foam roller, I'm going to do some uh, pelvic positioning exercises. Yeah. Then at such and such time, the music starts, at such and such time I'm doing this. and like. Yeah. So it's very regimented, so it's just nice. like, you kind of lose yourself in the mindlessness of yeah. that routine. Yeah. And then I pop out on the field and it's like I'm throwing, yeah. I have my music in, so I'm listening to music. I, like, so there's this whole yeah. routine that I go through so that when I step out on the mound, I'm like, all right, now it's, it's time to lock in. The same as every day. Yeah. It's, it's forcing yourself back into that same mental state. Right. So playoffs come around and it's like, oh, you have a start against the Yankees in Yankee Stadium on short rest. Like, how are you going to handle this? I'm like, that's the same that's, as every day. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get to the field. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to eat at these times. And then I'm going to go out there and pitch. And then whatever happens is going to happen yeah. based on what happens in the game. You know? So it's like, I can control. And this is something that I learned from through all those years of like the yeah. daily mental preps. Like I can control what I do. I prepare, I practice, I sleep, I eat, whatever. Yep. I can't control what someone else is going to do. Yep. So if I go out and I do everything to the best of my ability and that person's better, then they're going to be better that day. Yeah. And it's not worth worrying about because I'm okay with failing. Yep. Because I've trained myself to embrace failure as yeah. a learning opportunity, yeah. you know? It's, it's, you look at the drone, you find the adjustment, yeah. you see what needs to change, and then you go back in and Right, yeah, I done. snap an arm, I'm like, oh, that was dumb, and I just replace it and go on. Yeah. It's not like this crushing moment where yeah. I, like, I broke something and I failed. Yeah, you walk somebody, and now you've got to figure out, okay, what do I need to change about what's going on right now to, yeah. to adapt and strike the next guy out. Yep, and so as long as you, like, if you get beat in competition, yeah. as long as you learn from that, and you can take and say, like, okay, I did everything I could to the best of my ability, I felt great and I got beat. Is my process really as good as I think it is? Do I need to reevaluate? Or how is that guy better than me? Is yeah. it just uh, like he was just better today and I'll be better tomorrow? Yep. Or, and so you can like learn from it in that way yep. and high grade your process. Yep. But the individual act of failing, I think people get so consumed with like, oh, I failed. And the word failed sticks with them. Yeah. But you only grow through failure. Like yep. If you never push yourself past a limit, yep. you'll never learn anything new. You'll never grow. Yeah. You only grow by pushing yourself past that, past that limit, taking a chance of failure. You fail more often than not when you push yeah. yourself past the limit. And then you expand your boundaries a little bit and you slowly grow. Yeah. People don't embrace it that way. A lot of people ask, will ask me, like, how do, how do you get faster? Like, what do, you, what do you need to do to get faster? I'm just like, you got to not be afraid to crash. That's the less you need to learn. Yeah. And uh, just be ready to, to fix some gear and get going. But yeah. yeah. But if you never fly faster than you normally fly. Yeah, you're not going to get faster. Or if you don't want to crash. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, people ask me how to throw hard. I was like, well, when's the last time you actually tried to throw a ball as hard as you could? Like, uh, what, like what do you mean? I was like, well, when's the last time you <laughs> didn't care at all where it went and just try to throw it as hard as possible? Yeah. Like, uh, well, I mean, I, I try to throw them hard in the game. Like, yeah, but you're trying to hit a spot. Yeah. I want you to go out to a park in the middle of nowhere and just throw a ball as far as you can yeah. in some direction over there and not care where it goes. Yep. Because then your body learns, like, oh, I can move that way. Yeah. And then, like, then you can start refining that. Yeah. That's the only way you build velocity. It's yeah. the same thing. The only way you go faster is by flying faster. By failing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if you fly, if you always fly at 100 miles an hour and then you pick up a slower drone, and you're only going 50, like that becomes a very easy problem to solve. Yes. But if you only fly at 25, and then now you're suddenly you have to go 50 to compete, like yeah. you got no chance. Yeah. So. It's like taking off the batting weight. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> cool.
Well, I've got a million more questions that I could ask you. Um, I would love to go into stuff like what it was it mean to be professional and stuff like that, but uh, I think we're starting to run run short on time. Did that get in the way or? Okay, cool. Um, but so the reason that we're here today, and I'm sorry, I have to do this part of it for the DRL. <laughs> They can cut that out if they want to. Uh, is so so the Drone Racing League uh, this season we're going to be hosting our largest live event at uh, Chase Field in uh, Arizona. My original home. Exactly. Yeah. So that was another big part of the connection here. Um, and uh, it's a we are basically going to be putting ticket sales out. They should be available today. Now on uh, Eventbrite, Ticketmaster, those sorts of things. Um, link in the description below. And uh, and and so we're just kind of here. We've been out here flying for the last couple of days and hanging out and getting to know each other to, to kind of promote that kind of connection between MLB and baseball and love of drones and what it means to be a, um, a high performing individual. Yep. I won't say athlete because it's clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so please definitely check that out. And Trevor, uh, I, def I worked with DRL. I begged them to let me give you a Racer 3. They said that they couldn't spare them right now because they're <laughs> running really low. Um, but they did say that we'll get you get, get hold of some VIP tickets for you, if not for the one at Chase Field, because I think it actually does conflict with the game we checked on. But uh, for one of the other ones throughout the season, come yeah, check awesome. it out and see what it's like in person. And, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so. I've, I've long, I've long had a vision of creating a stadium tour with a drone of yeah. every stadium that I play in. Yep. And unfortunately, I'm not able to do it because, uh, you know, the drone laws and, and the stadiums and stuff, yeah. for player safety and yeah. whatever. But the fact that you guys get to race in a yeah. in a stadium, like I, I can't wait to see that course and like what it's just all the different little yeah. areas that you can explore and like yep. it's gonna be it's gonna be really cool maybe 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 we can convince them to like let you give like an exhibition run a little <laughs> attempt maybe like a race against one of the pilots or something like that would be fun yeah that'd be great um obviously the courses look awesome on tv you know? yeah oh, so yeah. I, i'm super excited to get out there and, and see one cool well yep. thank you very much for your time today thank this you. has been a blast yeah it's been great cool enjoyed it all all right get your tickets we'll see you soon